stay apart, to stay alive. As the death count rose in London over the summer of 1665, the king took action to try to co contain the spread of plague. He issued a proclamation banning all public gatherings, even funerals. The theaters and pubs were forced to close, along with universities. Parliament was canceled. All trade was stopped. Scotland closed the borders with England to try to keep the plague out. As a result of the government's action, many people lost their jobs, but many more likely owed their lives to this early example of social distancing, a measure to prevent infection that would be used again and again in epidemics right up to the present day. The streets are empty. By mid-July, there were a thousand people dying in London each week. By September, it was up to a thousand a day. A Londoner named Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary, but now how few people I see and those walking like people that have taken leave of the world. Samuel was a successful businessman. But unlike most wealthy people, he didn't live, he didn't leave London during the plague. Instead, he stayed and recorded his impressions in his diary, which was published almost two centuries later. It was one of the most revealing records of what life was like for people in London during that terrible year. In the fall, the plague raged across the city. Samuel wrote, Lord, how empty the streets are. The melancholy, so many poor sick people in the streets full of sores and so many sad stories overheard as I walk. Everybody talking of this death and that man sick and so many in this place and so many in that. And they tell me that in Westminster, there is never a physician, but one apothecary left, all being dead, but that there are great hopes of a great decrease this week. God sent it. Sure enough, as fall turned to winter and the weather became colder, the plague deaths began to subside. At the end of the year, as people began to cautiously returning to the city, John Grant published an analysis of the epidemic, calling London's dreadful visits or a collection of the bill of mortuary for this present year. It's estimated that 68,000 people out of a population of 450,000 had died of plague. In a single year, the disease had wiped out about 15% of London's population. New knowledge, but no cure. By looking carefully at statistics, John Grant helped people realize that epidemics could be predicted. High number of unusual deaths might point to the start of an outbreak of disease. People no longer had to look to the stars for signs of a coming epidemic. They just had to pay attention to what was happening around them. It was the beginning of a more scientific approach to disease, control and prevention. Still, much about plague remained a puzzle in 1665. How did the disease start? How did it spread? Do you catch it from breathing infection air? From contact with a victim? Could you get it from something you ate or drank? There was no answers to these questions, which made preventing and treating plague a risky guessing game. To avoid catching plague, some doctors held co gold coins in their mouth while they treated patients, believing the precaution, the pressure, I'm sorry, the precious metal protected them. Others recommended burning herbs and spices mixed with vinegar or tar to clean the air.
so many people believed that smoking tobacco would prevent plague, that schoolboys were punished if they forgot to smoke each morning before their prayer. Some people wore amulets filled with toad poison to ward off the disease. And con artists sold worthless powders and mixtures, passing them off as exotic wonder drugs, powder unicorn horn, phoenix eggs, and the kidney stone of caramel. There was no way to cure plagues. The doctors could do little to treat it. Bleeding had been recommended as a cure for fevers since ancient Greek and Roman ties. Although people often died from the loss of blood, doctors continued to bleed their patients. Sweating was another common treatment. It was based on the idea that because plagues cause fevers, it should be treated with heat. Doctors piled on blankets and so stoked up a fire near the victim's bed, hoping that their patient would sweat out the plague poison. If neither bleeding nor sweating worked, there was opium to dull the pain, if you could afford it. When that failed, there was only prayers left. According to John Grunt's statistics, there were 9,967 births in London that year compared to 97,306 burials. Some wondered if a city's population would ever recover. John pointed out that London was an incredibly dangerous place to live at all times. Every year, there were far more deaths in the city than there were births. And yet the population continued to grow because people in the surrounding countrysides were constantly coming to London, looking for work or a better life. John predicted that within a few years, London's population would rebound thanks to newcomers from the country. Again, he was right. Slowly, life began to return to normal in the city as far as people forgot a year of terror and death. Finding Answers in Hong Kong. More than 200 years after the epidemic in London, scientists finally identified the source of the plague. In 1894, an epidemic of bubonic plague in Hong Kong killed 80,000 people. The governor, Sir William Robinson, called for scientists to come to Hong Kong to search for solutions to save the city. A famous Japanese scientist, Shiburo Kishakto answered his plea. Shiburo Shibarso arrived, was celebrated in the papers, and he was given his own laboratory and staff of assistants. Nobody paid much attention for another foreign researcher to answer the call for help. Alexander Yersin, a young Swiss bacteriologist, a specialist studying diseases, carrying microbes, and how to cure or treat the illness they cause, who had been practicing medicine in the French colony of Indochina, now the countries of Vietnam and Cambodia, as an unknown scientist. Alexander didn't get the same warm welcome as the famous Shishabashu. The Hong Kong official didn't even offer him a lab. He had to pay, his, pay to have his own lab built, a slow straw hut not far from the much grander building occupied by Shishiburu. The two scientists were soon racing to be the first to discover the source of the plague. The competition was so fierce that Shishibusho tried to prevent Alexander from getting access to bodies of plague victims. Alexander had to bribe soldiers, guards guarding the plagues, wards of hospitals to bring him the blood and tissue samples he needed. That June, each man announced they had successfully isolated the bacteria that was causing the plague. At first, Shishibishu was credited with the discovery, but then 
the scientific community discover that Alexander had been first. And the name and the bacteria was named Yersinae pestis in his honor. A few years later, French researcher Paul Louis Sinden discovered the fleas called Xenophysia. Chupoas transferred the infection from a rat to a rat when a rat died. Its fleas sometimes jumped to a nearby human. Their bites passed the disease to human. It took nearly 40 years for Simon's research to be accepted by the scientific and medical communities, but the mystery of plagues were finally solved. The future of plague. Today, plagues can be successfully treated with antibiotics if patients get medical attention in time, but the disease is still a fear killer. In 1993, South and Central India were rattled by seven earthquakes that damaged a number of cities, including Bangaro, Bombay, Hyderabad, and Madras, as well as many smaller villages and towns. In the earthquake aftermath, huge Shinto towns and slums sprung up to house people who had been left homeless by the disaster. The Shinto towns also sheltered large number of rats. In September of 1994, plague broke out in one of the largest slums in the city of Surat. 55 people died and a significant number compared to the terrible death tolls of the medieval plague epidemics, but enough to make headlines around the world. Commercial air traffic to and from India stopped. The stock market in India crashed. Trade halted and the media went crazy, speculating about the possibility that plague could spread to other countries, triggering a massive pandemic. Luckily, it didn't happen. Although plague is considered a disease of the past, it is alive and well and living in rodents around the world. Plague is an endemic in part of Africa, including the island of Madagascar, where the disease infects a few hundred people each year. In 2017, Madagascar had an outbreak of plague that was traced back to a man who developed symptoms while traveling across the island in a shared public taxi. 31 people who came into contact with him came down with plague and four people died. The World Health Organization considered plague a re-emerging disease, a possible threat that requires constant monitoring. Okay, turn back to page 23, Gaunt's legacy. John Gaunt discovered that plague years were predicted by sticky, sickly years was a huge step forward in tracking disease. His recommendation that doctors and health officials pay close attention to all unexplained increases in death rates is still helping epidemiologists pinpoint and stop disease outbreaks today. It was only after the Spanish influenza pandemic in the early 20th century that investigator Wade Hampton Frost realized that the rate of pneumonia had been unusually high in the months leading up to the massive outbreak of the flu in U.S. Army camps. Looking back, Wade suspected that what doctors had been calling pneumonia was really been early cases of the Spanish influenza. If someone had remembered the lesson of John Gaunt and looked into the sudden jump in pneumonia cases, it might have led to an earlier identification of the illness. The Spanish flu swept through the United States before going global and killing millions worldwide in the winter of 1918. In 2019, when doctors of Huan, China noticed more pneumonia causes than usual. 
they were quick to let the authorities know, hoping to avert another pandemic. But the virus had a head start. Turn to page 24. Unequal treatment. In 1665, only the wealthy and middle class could afford doctors. The thousands of poor people who suffered from the plague during the London epidemic mostly relied on low cost home remedies. A booklet from the Royal College of Physicians called Certain Necessity Directions for the Prevention and Cure of the Plague recommended that surfire method for treating painful swollen lymph node glands or buboes pull off the feathers from the tails of live living cocks, hen, hens, pigeons, or chickens. Hold their bills, hold them hard to the botch or swelling. And so keep them at that point until they, the birds, die. By this means, drawing out the poison. No chicken handy? There were alternatives. Take a great onion, howl. Take a great onion, howl it. Put into a fig cut small. Put it into a wet paper and roast it in embers. Apply it hot under the turmeric. Once, once popular remedies were called this trickle. A truckle is a thick syrup. To make it, you need nearly 60 ingredients from cinnamon, pepper, and cloves to exotic items like viper flesh, opium, beaver glands, dead sea salt, vipers, all sold out. London truckle was a simpler option, a mixture of Cuban seeds, bayberries, snake root, cloves, and honey. Turn to page 27. The cotton connection. London's Great Plague. London's Great Plague may have started with infected rats and their fleas hitching rise to the city on bales of cotton imported from Holland. Just the year before, more than 50,000 people had died in a plague epidemic in Amsterdam, Holland and there was a busy trade in cotton between the two cities. The first deaths in the London epidemic happened in a neighborhood called South Guys in a field where many dock workers lived. These workers could have been bitten by plague infected fleas while unloading bales of cotton from the boats and bringing it to the city for sale. Ironically, John Grunt may have been selling cotton made, may have been selling cloth from the cotton in his ship, in his shop, while spending his evenings tracking the speed of the epidemic it had caused through the city. Trade, travel, and disease have a long history of connections from the trade caravans that brought plague rats to Europe from Central Asia to the slave ships that carried mosquitoes breeding yellow fever to the United States, to today's international flights that can carry virus infected humans anywhere they want to go. Whatever humans have found a way to make travel easier and faster, they have also made the spread of diseases easier and faster. Turn to page 29. A perfect pair, cities and diseases. As soon as humans started living in permanent settlements, we opened the door to disease calling microbes. Disease spread easily in crowded conditions and densely packed cities with poor sanitation are the perfect breeding grounds for epidemics. Until the 20th century, so many city dwellers died each year from infectious diseases that without a steady stream of new arrivals from the countryside, most cities would have soon become ghost towns. Plague was one of the most feared diseases 
because its deadly epidemic seemed to come out of nowhere. And in fact, the agent responsible for transmitting plagues to humans is almost invisible. The culprit is the flea rat. Attracted by human garbage, rats had moved into the settlements, bringing along their annoying roommates. Yersinia pestis, the bacteria that causes plagues. In their guts and bloodstreams, and the fleas in their fur. Once a flea bites a rat infected with Yersinia, it carries the bacteria along to the next rat or person it dines on. In the crowded, unsanitary cities, fleas jumped easily from rat to humans. For many unlucky people, those flea bites weren't only itchy, they were deadly. As trade routes were established between cities, rats carrying plague went along for the ride. They spread across Asia and Europe, touching off the bubonic plague pandemic of the 1300s and the epidemic of plague that followed, including the Great Plague of London. Page 30. Three plagues, one cause. There are three types of plagues, bubonic, pneumonic, and septic. All three forms of plagues are caused by the same bacteria, Yuseni pestis. Bubonic plague is one of the most famous and most feared but it is actually the least deadliest of the three. In bubonic plague, the bacteria attacks the lymphatic system, causing lymph nodes in the patient's neck. Underarms are grown to develop painful swelling, traditionally called bubus, as well as reddish or purple markings on the skin. In the 17th century England, these round marks were known as plague to kit heels. Before the bubos or plagues tokens appearance, the patients suffered fever, headaches, chills, vomiting, and extreme exhaustion. More than half of all bubonic plague sufferers died within two weeks of the appearance of bubos. Pneumonic plague is even more deadly. It attacks the lungs and spreads through the air when victims cough and sneeze. Nearly everyone infected with pneumonic plague will die within two to four days. It starts with fever and a headache, but soon the victims begin coughing up blood and their lungs fill with fluid until they can no longer breathe. In septemic plagues, the rarest form of the disease, the bacteria infected the patient's bloodstream. Death can happen so quickly that sometimes no symptoms appear. When there are symptoms, including fever and weakness, followed by bleeding from the mouth, the nose and internal bleeding, without treatment, victims of septemic plague will die in less than a day. Today, antibiotics can successfully treat about 85% of cases of plague if the drugs are started during the first 24 hours of infection. Page 31, Addicted to Statistics. In 2020, the world tracked the emergence of a new case of COVID-19, day by day and even hour by hour, in the news and on social media. In 1665, people watched the number of published in the bills of mortality just as eagerly. At least 5,000 copies of the bill were printed each week and people snatched up the latest issue to find out which neighborhoods had new cases and whether the epidemic was showing signs of slowing down. The bill of mortality to all our Greeks is increased by 399 this week and the increase in general through the whole city and suburbs, which makes us all sad wrote Londoner Samuel Pepys on November 3rd, 1665. Anyone following the toll of COVID-19 deaths in the news and on social media would understand just how Pepys must have felt.